And it's time to get over to Moira mm -hmm. with a very special guest. Moira. Well, death is not a topic most people like to discuss. You might be expecting the next few minutes to be depressing. But I think you can see, if you take a little glance at the highlights I've made in this book, it has been an inspiration to me. May I walk you home, sharing Christ's love with the dying. Well, for a period of two and a half years, Melody Rossi's life was utterly consumed with the illnesses and deaths of people she loved. I, you were able to write a book that is such a practical help to people who have loved ones who don't know the Lord. That's right. Well, in 1994, I experienced a very serious illness as a result of a surgical error. And after that, I was in bed for a year. Mm -hmm. So during that time, I really became aware of what it's like to have your body fail and how frustrating it is. And I think that God was really preparing me for what was going to come as my parents were dying. Mm -hmm. It's really important when somebody is sick that you just find a way to connect with them. Um, we're going to talk about the king of the nightlife, the intellectual, and the material girl. <laughs> Who were these precious people in oh, your life? Well, the king of nightlife was my father, and um, he uh, was in the bar business. He had mafia connections, and um, this, you know, this was something he loved. He always had a crowd around him. He was, you know, charming and vivacious, and all of those things but completely without God. But it was actually the intellectual, your mom, who was the first crisis, six years after your hospital stay. That's right. My mom was quite an intellectual. That's part of the reason she and my dad didn't get along. They just had really different backgrounds. She had grown up in a Christian home and um, had very godly parents and had walked away from the Lord. She'd been married one other time and that just had not worked out for her and she became very bitter towards God. But she was a university professor mm. and um, I think she found in her education uh, a different way of looking at the world than, than through the message that she'd learned at home from her parents. She just considered herself an agnostic and and anything that had to do with the church, she didn't want to hear about it. She didn't want to talk about God. It was very taboo for her. Oh, this is looking like really tough soil. Uh, right. And now the third one, the material girl, your stepmother. Rita was my dad's wife, and they were together for about 30 years, I think. So um, my parents got divorced when I was really young, and, and Rita was in our life for a long time. And she did become a good friend. She did. It wasn't always that way. You know, I think that's the case when, when you're a child and there's another woman in your life. But um, she grew up in a Catholic church. She grew up in Beverly Hills and went to Catholic school, but she didn't buy into any of it. She thought it was all fairy tales. She told me that herself. Now you express your own sense of inadequacy and overwhelm, not really knowing what to do, but that word care, the serving has become in, in all of these uh, scenarios. That is the, the power tool, at least the entry point in terms That's of right. knowing what to do. Right. Well, I think a lot of times when someone is ill, or especially if we know that they're dying, we think, uh, you know, what can I do? We want to call the pastor. We want to, uh, you, know, you know, bring in some professional. Those little things that become a point of connection are places where God opens a door to credibility about other things so yes. that we can then have a voice with them if we're willing to do those little things that are important to them. That makes so much sense. You, you have a, a lovely suggestion in the book. You say, ask God to give you a gentle demeanor and help you recognize the real issues in your loved one's heart. And those issues will go beyond the need for physical comfort. There may be unresolved relational issues, That's a, right. a host of things that are uppermost in their heart, and, and you can address those. And as you discovered, even with your first tragedy, your own tragedy, uh, what looks devastating uh, and unkind can actually be the answer to your own prayers. This is a wonderful book. You know, a bittersweet 
side of this story, Melody, is that your own health crisis left you unable to have children. That's right. But tell us about Cloud and Fire. Well, Cloud and Fire Ministries is an urban ministry to at-risk youth and incarcerated youth. And so God has given me the joy of allowing me to mother and parent <laughs> multiple kids. There we are at our Look youth at center. Kids. This youth center is at the crossfire of two rival gangs, I understand. That's right. Right in Los Angeles, That's California. That's right. It's the, it's the heart of all the gang activity in the San Fernando Valley. And you're taking some of the older boys for great adventures. We do, we go whitewater rafting, we visit all the national parks, there we are at Yosemite, and all of these young people have graduated, many of them have gone to college and um, are working, and God is just using this to um, do mighty things for them. And Now and your byline is equipping others for life's journey. These right. men are in prison. That's right. These are boys 14 to 18. They're all gang members, and they're all raising their hands right there to receive Christ. It's a, it's a wonderful joy to be able to do that. Wow. Turning lemons into lemonade in a most significant and eternal way. Maybe even lemon meringue pie. You have a wonderful quote right in the beginning of your book. Amy Carmichael is a favorite, mm. a wonderf wonderful single missionary. And she said, we will have all eternity to celebrate the victories, but only a few hours before sunset to win them. That's right. You, you had miles and miles of desert. That's right. But, but it's so worth surprise. it. It's so worth it. Please be sure to get your copy of this book.